All right, well, let's get started. Um, <clears throat> thank you for all coming. My name is uh, Daniel McKelvey, and I work for a company called EdCast. Um, we were founded actually at Stanford University um, about three years ago, and we have been uh, intimately involved with the edX community. Um, if you recall, Rob Rubin was the original uh, CTO that was there, that Rob has now moved over to Microsoft, and we kind of started the relationship with him and Anant and Lee, and uh, we've been working with them uh, ever since. So um, there was a slide that I think Joel had put up with respect to the number of courses and the number of instances, just to kind of give you a flavor of what we do. Um, we're very active in the community. We run over 100 open edX sites for our customers, and uh, we have over 350 courses that we power uh, for our customers, both on the corporate side as well as the higher ed. So hopefully that gives you a little, little context about that. Um, what I'm gonna talk to you guys about today is really kind of extending the open edX uh, learning experience as well as the community into what we call the informal learning or, or more of the micro learning. Um, we do a lot of work with corporations. We found a tremendous amount of value with layering and adding the informal onto the formal. Uh, to really be able to enhance the learning experience. So I'm gonna walk you through um, that whole process today. Uh, I'll talk about a couple of case studies and then we'll save about 10 or 15 minutes at the end for a Q&A. So w when you look at what organizations are dealing with today, there are a, a, a tremendous amount of different factors, if you will, that are all kind of hitting employees as well as students and workers from all different directions. Um, they could be new behaviors how you go about actually building the community, how you participate in the community, how you do your work life. Those things are changing, they're quicker, they're faster. Technology and business are moving very, very quickly. Um, obviously, from a technology perspective, there is a tremendous amount of impact. When you think about it, five years ago, did we ever think we were gonna have an autonomous self-driving car? That's a very, I mean, I'm looking forward to that. It's a little scary, but I think that would be a, you know, that's an incredible technology. Think about AI, think about robotics. A lot of the things that we would, you know, do by, man, by hand, we're gonna obviously automate all that stuff. So the technologies is a key element. Um, the millennial workforce is a very, very significant uh, force, if you will, in the marketplace. By 2020, they're gonna be 50% of it. And I think it's by 2050, they're gonna be 75% of that. So when you look at millennials, they learn a different way, they act a different way, they communicate a different way. How do we deal with that? Particularly when you're talking about business transformation. If you think of the baby boomers that are you know, the executives today and that's migrating over to the millennials, how do you do that without business disruption? Very, very difficult challenge there. Uh, mobility, everybody, you know, as you know, is, is, is always on the, uh, the mobility side. And the idea there is, is that everything seven by 24 in your pocket, anytime you want, it's all gonna be there. So how do we basically accommodate that? How do we embrace it? And how do we make sure that all the technology uh, is really all on the mobile? And then the last item when you kind of think about it is, um, what I kind of think of is, is really more of the globalization. There's no more geo boundaries. Everybody now is seven by 24, whether you're in China, you're Brazil, you're in London, you're in the US, you don't have any boundaries there. And when you talk about the development, when you talk about the productivity, it's going round the clock. So how do you account for that? How do you build your business? How do you enhance your business to be able to handle that? So these factors, if you will, all come in and really create a very, very different work world where we have to basically rethink how we're gonna basically tackle learning, how we're gonna tackle education, how we're gonna tackle knowledge, and how we're gonna share it and apply it. So let's think about the organization. The, the, the interesting thing that we found is if you look at one organization that's been around for probably the longest period of time, it's GE. They have been in business for 130, maybe 140 years, and they are doing a massive digital transformation. And the reason why they're doing it is because for them to be able to compete effectively in today's world, they cannot do what they did five years, 10 years, 20 years ago. They have to change to be what they call a more agile environment. And this is across the board, whether they're building engines, healthcare products, uh, you know, water sewage, whatever the element is that they're building, they have to do it in a much, much quicker capacity. And it's almost like create the thesis, prove or disprove the thesis and improve the product and do that very, very quickly and efficiently. Another thing that we're looking at from an organization is, is that when you think about the automation, literally anything that can get automated is getting automated or is already automated. So that actually is driving more efficiencies and we need to, the organization needs to think about that. 
And what that's leading to is when you really think about what is out there from a human perspective to really do their work, it's all about innovation and creativity. That's really what it boils down to. And look at Apple. You know, they have a phenomenal product that they've made. It's a very complicated product, but they've made it simple to use. So when you think about the innovation they've done and the creativity of that, anybody can use an iPhone or an iPad. So that's where you really find a lot of the workforce is really kind of pushing towards, if you will, uh, from, a, uh, from a human perspective. And um, last but not least is when you think of the skill base of people, the skill base of people is changing so, so quickly. There is a stat out there that basically says in two, uh, in two and a half years, you're going to lose 50% of the knowledge that you know. Think about that for a second. In five years, you're obsolete. When you think about that, the question is, how do we combat that? How do we basically tune that? And that's really where this learning and the education and the knowledge consumption is so critical. Because if you don't keep up to date on your skills, you're going to become obsolete. So when you think about all the changes to the organization, that's clearly what they're doing with. But the challenge is, is that when we think about learning and we think about sharing knowledge, we haven't changed a thing. Maybe we've gone from textbooks to online and stuff like that. But when you really think about how we apply it, we really haven't changed. And that's one of the fundamental challenges that organizations are dealing with today. So let's, all, let's shift right now to the learner. <laughs> This guy, I, just, I saw this and it just it kind of cracked me up. But when you think about the, the, the learner, there is no question that the information that's out there, it's overwhelming. We are a fire hydrant, you know, right up to the mouth, consume it all. Very challenging to deal with that. The distraction level across the organization, you've got your bosses, your colleagues, you've got friends, social media, everything. Huge distraction. No one has time. How many people are working 7 by 24? They, don't, they can't even get through their emails all, every day and so on and so forth. Time is, is the most valuable asset that, that we have. And then think about social. Think about the, all the elements that are going out there with Twitter and with Facebook, LinkedIn. Actually, it should be Microsoft now, but and so on and so forth. The whole idea about that social element, about communicating and collaborating with people, it's just very, very overwhelming. And then last but not least, workers really don't have any allegiance to their employer when you really think about it. They will, sh they will jump, particularly millennials, they will jump from organization to organization in a heartbeat. What are they really looking for? They're looking for a better place where they can learn. It's not even money, which is really, when you think about it, it's an incredible concept. You could actually give the person a third more in their salary, but they, the millennials will turn that down if they have an opportunity to be able to learn more and to be able to grow more from an internal perspective. That's really what they're looking for. So this idea about going from work to worker or employer to employer to employer, it's only going to speed up. So from a learner's perspective, that's a lot. And then lastly, when you really kind of think about you know, the jobs that are out there, this goes back to the whole concept of you know, automation, if you will, of really kind of you know, segregating, not segregating, excuse me, shifting from really more of the manual and the traditional type roles more into the innovation, to the creativity, and the thought leadership type roles. So again, you're really looking over here at the curiosity, the creativity, and the empathy. That's really what the workers are faced with today. And how do you retool? How do you actually get into that mode? Because that's where the dollar is, that's where the value is, and that's where the need is. When you think about knowledge and you think about education and learning and so forth, what's really the end goal there? What's the business value? And the business value is, is that you can actually apply it, plain and simple. You've got to be able to apply it. You've got to solve problems. You've got to get stuff done. You've got to complete you know, programs or products, et cetera. So that's really, at the end of the day, that's what we're all shooting for. The question is, how do we get there? We can always capture and we can share knowledge. Those are key elements in there. But really, the, the sharing is the element where we really learn. And that's really how we get into a comfort zone where we can learn it and we can apply it. And the fundamental on really sharing that knowledge is, is that you've got to be in an environment where you really trust the other people that are around you. If you're going to get thrown under the bus, you're never going to apply it. So when you think about the networks of community and how you build and how you grow and how you engage, the fundamental element in there is to have a level of trust. Without it, you'll never be successful. So this is an interesting slide that, that, uh, that we saw that I thought was really interesting. 
when you think about corporate learning and the fact that they haven't changed, where do they put all their money? They put all their money you know, into the formal learning. And just to give you a perspective, GE spends a billion dollars a year on education and learning. It is a huge investment for them. I mean, obviously it's a very, very large organization, but just think about that for a quick second. A billion dollars a year, a hundred million a month, 30 million a day, 370,000. So it's worldwide. So it, it's a big number. It's a big, big number. But you think about it, this is where they're spending all their money. But when you really think about the power of it, how do we really learn? And this is the whole concept of extending you know, open edX into the informal way. The way that they're really learning is really informally. It's no different than you and I talking right here. We're not taking a course. We're not doing formal learning. I don't have a textbook or anything like that. We're just talking about a topic of you know, how corporates are dealing with learning on that. So it's really more of the informal learning is where people are getting the value out of it, but corporations are spending it in the wrong place. So think about the impact, just for a quick second. Think about the impact if corporate spend was moved even 50-50 or 75-25 over to the informal. What would that do for productivity? What would that do for our GDP? What would that do for businesses top and bottom line? The impact would be staggering. So I, I know you guys have probably all seen the, uh, the 70 20 10 model from Jennings and so forth, but this is where you really kind of break it down where you've got the experiential, you've got the social, and then you've got the, the traditional structured courses or that structured learning on that. And the whole fundamental shift, the paradigm shift here is really, it's not one or the other. It's a question of what's the blend of them that give you the greatest output. No one's gonna throw formal training or courses into the, the garbage and never do that again. They're going to do it. The real question though is, is that, how do you blend these three to really be able to achieve the maximum output or the maximum business value? That's the trick. And this is a, the, the Internet Time Alliance came out with this thing, which is really, you know, it's a pretty strong statement. You know, it's more effective, it's less, ex, less expensive, and the output is higher. So the question is, why wouldn't you do that? Why won't corporations do that? And, the, and what we're seeing right now is just that they are going very aggressively in this, in this direction. They are trying to apply it and trying to figure it out. But you have to understand, or um, maybe you all do, but... Corporations have been in a set mode of how they go about learning for so much period of time. And all of a sudden we're saying, hey, I got to take you out of that mode. I'm going to put you into a world where you're not comfortable. It's outside of your comfort zone. And you got to be able to figure this out. And by the way, you're millennials. You don't know anything about them. They're scared of those people because they don't know how to deal with them. Yet they know that they're going to be such a powerful workforce, part of the workforce, that they've got to figure that out. These are the challenges that we see in, in, in the corporate market. Um, and and it's, it's very, very prolific. So let me give you just a little background of what EdCast is doing and, and what we're all about. Um, we've really kind of created a full stack platform for customers in the corporate as well as in the higher ed uh, space that we really kind of focus on both the, the informal and, and on the formal side. So when we look at informal learning, it's really kind of more of this, this micro uh, bite-sized type learning where you can consume content day in and day out. And the reason why you want to be able to do that is you're continually tooling your mind. You're continually learning. You're applying that. You can actually get the immediate value. It could be a small piece of information, you know, three, five, ten minutes. You got a problem, get it solved. You got a question, you get it answered. You got, you got a piece of deliverable that needs to get done, boom, you can get it done on that. It becomes part of the daily culture. It's a very critical element because that is the way that you keep people, if you will, tooled up and effective at work. If they don't do that, you're taking your most valuable asset and you're effectively washing it down the drain. So um, let me give you, what's your name? Taras. Taras, what, what, what kind of work do you do? Uh, I've been in building learning platforms in Russia. In Russia, okay. Yes. I'm not very familiar with Russia, but let me, let me um, what kind, when you deal with learning, what, what's, what, is your, what do you do in, a day, in, a, in your day-to-day -day job? Tell me the type of information that you consume, the type of knowledge that that you, you know, you read or you absorb and I stuff like that. Information from the programmers, from the stakeholders, and trying to create the ecos learning ecosystems, uh, getting the information from one of them and structure this 
uh, learning environments to uh, the different people to learn and communicate in them. Okay, so that sounds like you're bringing a lot of information together in a very short period of time and being able to share that information with a lot of other people, right? Yes. Okay, so that's, I'm sure, a very time-consuming process. You probably do a lot of surfing on the web. You're probably doing a lot of curating of that content out there of, you know, what's good content, what's not good content, is it appropriate, not appropriate, et cetera, et cetera. Is that, is that a fair assessment? Yes, and we are also creating system that is, you're, you're trying to describe for creating social learning and building the net of experts and connect them to the learning management system. So when I see your points, I see something like that that we're developing right now for the, our huge enterprise companies like uh, Rosatom, Rossetti, and Rosnano. So it's very familiar for me. Okay, so you have a very fundamental problem that, frankly, a lot of people have on that. Yes. And this is one of the challenges that we wanted to go out there and to be able to solve. And that is, when you look at, a, a, at an individual that's trying to do their job, there's all these different types of channels of information. Okay, that could be any type of topic, it could be at any level of expertise and so forth. What we wanted to be able to do through some algorithms and through some technology is to be able to look at the individual, understand what their, their role is all about, what's their job, what are the competencies, what are their interests, what are the experts that they want to be able to learn from, and be able to bring that all together into a personalized feed. And the whole idea of that feed is to be able to serve up, very similar to Twitter, but be able to serve up that bite-sized piece of information that you continually digest and stay current on your job. But it has to be personalized to you because what you want versus what I want could be very different. And if I'm going to create an experience that's good for you and that's good for me, the content that you want and the content I want is not necessarily the same. So that's a key part of that from a, you know, from a feed perspective. We also curate that content. So the question is, where does that content come from? Does it come from the web? Does it come from internal systems? Is it syndicated? Is it user generated, et cetera? We bring that content together so that we can make sure that when you're getting that information, it is the highest quality curated content for exactly what you're looking to do. The, the experts is a, um, I'm glad you brought that up, Tross, because the experts in our minds is, is a very critical element. And this really goes back to kind of the, the baby boomer to the, um, to the millennial shift. One of the fundamental challenges that people have is, is that how do you get information from people that have it to those that need it? And how do you do it easily, cost effectively, and quickly? So what we ended up doing is we built a very, very um, uh, innovative technology that we call live streaming. So through our mobile app, which is both on Android and iOS, you can basically uh, do a click of a button and you can do a live stream. Actually, Klaus is doing one right now of myself. So it, you can capture someone's knowledge, whether it's real time or, or if you want to do it behind the scenes, you can do that. And what happens is that knowledge then can be shared with your team, can be shared at the departmental, the organizational level, or even to your partners and your customers. So let's think about this. you got a sales guy that just closed a deal, and he wants to be able to share that competitive information with the rest of his team. He could do a quick live stream, bam. The other people know about it. Everybody on that sales team is up to speed. It took five minutes. Very powerful way to get that information from him to everyone else on his team. Think about a product manager. If you're communicating with your top 20 customers and you want to be able to give them a, a very personalized experience about, hey, we're rolling out this new product here, the new features, et cetera, et cetera, you could do a live stream, invite them in on that. You could have that live back and forth communication and you could talk to them about that, about that product release. It's very powerful. And what we're finding with organizations is that they're taking the, the baby boomers that are not gonna write courses, they're not gonna make a presentation, they're not gonna do any of that. And you're lucky if they come in every day. And what the, but the, what they wanna do is they wanna use that to be able to take the knowledge out of the baby boomers capture it, and then put it into the right channels and then share that out to the people that can benefit from it. And the live stream does that real time. So we're the first organization that's released that out to the enterprise market. We've also created uh, a concept of, of both by, uh, insights and pathways. So the, the insights are really that small piece of, you know, of information that you can consume, consume. And then the pathways are an ability to actually curate those, those pieces of content together and to be able to put that into a, what we call a learning pathway. So if you have a sales manager or a product manager that wants to be able to bring that experience together for their team, they can create that pathway 
and then they can share that pathway out to their team or out to their organization so that they can benefit from it. So these are some of the micro learning type techniques, if you will, that we have, um, that we have built in what we call the knowledge network. Now the other side of the equation is something that you are all extremely familiar with, and this is really what we call the corporate academy, uh, which is all powered by open edX. So what we've done, and this is what we did originally when we started the company, is, is that we actually created the ability to institutionalize an, what we call an edX instance for a corporate customer. And we can do that in less than 20 minutes. So if someone says, hey, listen, I want to set up a, an open edX instance, and I want to be able to have a turnkey solution, where it's got the support and the maintenance and so forth on that, and that you can do the branding on that, and you can have all of the tools that we built on that. We can literally turn on a customer in, in 15, 20 minutes. So we call this the corporate academy out of the box. So it's a very powerful way. And this is why we're able to run so many instances is because we built this architecture to be able to do this and really be able to get customers up and running very, very quickly. It's all white labeled and it's completely integrated with the informal side. So, th so that you have that full extension of the informal and formal learning combined together as a platform. Is that a huge spike in that trend, the size trend you're making that you offer? To be perfectly <laughs> frank, I don't think Joel's numbers have our numbers a a as much in there because a lot of ours are corporate customers and they're very you know, private, if you will. So we can't really share those numbers, if you will. But, but um, we're, we're seeing that the corporate academy, look at Microsoft, look at McKinsey. They're doing all these corporate academies. Uh, Boeing's doing a corporate academy. It's all being done on the open edX platform. So this is, a, this is a huge way. Now this corporate academy, keep in mind that this can be internal or external or both. So we've built a whole layer of, of authentication and access that brings that all together. So if you want to do you know, the single sign-on with your employees or you want to have your partners and customers come in through a single sign-on or they come in through other access methods, we, we, we're able to do that. And I'll walk you through a couple of case studies on that, of what we've done on that. But the Corporate Academy is a, is a huge opportunity out there and we're seeing more and more corporates pick that up. Because what happens is, is that training through a Corporate Academy on open edX blows away the in-class or ILT or the other types of traditional learning. When you look at the effectiveness, you look at the cost, and you look at the time to put it into play. It's, it's really compelling. And that's why corporations are doing it. So again, you know, very simply put, our experience is really be able to bring these, these two elements together. So let me, let me just give you a quick example. EMC is one of our customers. They have a, a very large uh, user base, um, 40 plus thousand, uh, that they just started in the last nine months. And what they're doing is, is that they're creating a presence out there of very, very deep expertise in technical areas like big data, the data center, DevOps, those types of elements. So what happened is we powered these, this, this corporate academy for them. Um, and to give you a perspective, I had a, a very interesting uh, dialogue when we ran the first course with them. The, the, the key executive said, hey, Daniel, you know, this, is, this was a lot more work than we thought. And his name's Ed. And I said, well, Ed, what do you mean by that? And he goes, well, we had, we had about 15 to 20,000 people in the first course, and they had three people that were actually monitoring it. You know, and there was, a, it, there was a tremendous amount of community element to it. They had 250 groups. They had very high level engagement. They had very high completion rates, et cetera. And I said, okay, you had three people that were doing that. And he goes, yep, that was a lot more than we anticipated. I said, well, Ed, let me give you a perspective on it. The amount of people that you put through that training, you did it in a month. If you had done it your traditional way, it would have taken you over 10 years. So that is a very compelling argument. The other thing that I said to him was is that they ended up using this as a very, a very innovative strategy to scrape the top 5% of the, the students or the, the people off of that, and they actually used that as a recruiting tool. So when you think about it, the amount that they would pay to a recruiter effectively built the, bought the system for one person. Very, very, very compelling. And then just one other quick one. Um, we've also, uh, we power uh, another community for HP Life. This is a um, entrepreneur type community. 
about starting up businesses, running businesses, how you go about you know, creating the products and getting them out to market, getting the first customer and so forth. They have a $600,000 community, excuse me, 600,000 person community on that. And what we've done is we've actually done the full spectrum of that from both informal and formal learning. Now the formal is really kind of the initial drive because people want to take the courses. But the thing is, is once the course completes, what's the catalyst? to keep them in the community? What's the catalyst to learn? And that's really where the informal learning all comes into play. And I think John had said this, you know, about building these types of communities, you need to have that engagement, you need to have that trust and that experience last beyond a course. So the informal is so critical to that and that's why it complements the formal learning to really be able to drive and continue it. So that's EdCast. Any questions? That's, um, that's exactly what EMC is doing. When they built their, their community on that, they opened it up to everyone. And they know that their competitors are in there, but what they're looking to do is, is they want to create that presence in the market where they're the market leader, they're the innovator. So when a buyer says, hey, I'm thinking about analytics, I'm thinking about data center, they're thinking EMC. You know, and if they have, to, that, that's the competition, if you will. You know your competitor is going to be out there, but if you don't do it, you're, you're never going to get that, that innovative and that le market leadership position on that. Because when you think about customers, they're doing all of their research and all of the analysis and so on and so forth. They're going to get to 80, 85% of it before they even pick up the phone. So if you're not in front of them and being able to provide these types of services, you're going to have a very difficult time building you know, the business, growing the revenue, generating the margin and so forth. So that's where that knowledge is such a critical competitive edge. The question is, how do you go about using it? Yeah. And that's where what, what you know, EMC has done there is that they've taken a very strategic position you know, uh, internally about how they're doing it. And it was so effective from a community perspective externally, which is where they started. Now they're doing it all internally in the same capacity. So those are numbers that we can't really disclose because it becomes a little bit more, um, it becomes a little bit sensitive from the agreements that we have. But what I can tell you on that is, is that the, uh, the engagement rates that are internal are very high. They're well north of 70%. 70% of what? Of the people. Of, staff or staff? I'm thinking more of the employee engagement. When, when they're talking about the employees getting in there and being able to use that, the engagement rates are very high. When we talk about the engagement rates, we go out to the community and, and people out there, you really kind of got to look at that in two contexts. You know, first is don't just think about the person that signs up because they might sign up and never come into the course. But if you look at the person that actually comes into the course, what is the ability of them you know, or the percentage of them to actually complete it? Now, it's certainly not 70 percent, but it's a lot higher than the traditional rates of four, five, six percent. And that's where you're getting the throughput. Mm -hmm. uh, thing that you were talking about, how is it different from traditional webinars that cost to assess engagement or amount of time? Do you curate that content around uh, some more course material that you uh, encourage the people to build? Or how does that well, I think, okay, so, so um, let me just take a step back. When we actually set up the informal learning for a customer, we call that the knowledge network. So that becomes their private network, if you will. And then we work with them to be able to figure out how you want to be able to structure that content. Because it could be based on, it could be on, you know, the influencer, the expert. It could be based on uh, a particular topic, et cetera, et cetera. So how that is all designed, if you will, we have the social elements that are, that are part of that as well. So you as a user, when you go in there, you might say, hey, I'm interested in IoT and robotics. And I might not be interested in healthcare because I just it's not part of my job. So when you do that, you would follow the different channels or follow the different people. And then what happens is you start creating a very personalized stream for the type of content that, that you want. And when live streams come in there, 
those live streams are going to be, they can be tagged if they want, or they can go specifically into the channel if they're related to a particular topic or, you know, uh, you know, focal point, if you will, on that. So that's where the organization really has the, the ability to kind of create that taxonomy of how they want to have that information and that knowledge kind of grouped together and be able to, you know, be easily accessible to the employees or their partners or their customers. So it's something like Dell? Something like? It, system based on who you know. It's who you know. It's also learning about what are your your learning habits. So when we kind of think about, you know, does people, do they really like to consume video versus text versus blogs? You build that additional knowledge, if you will. So that's really the AI uh, component, the mach machine learning component that's in there that really kind of learns over time. Now, that's a, it's a difficult thing to do, quite frankly. It's not, it's in no way, shape, or form is it perfect or anything like that, but that's really where we kind of strive to it because the machine should really be automating the type of information that, that you should be consuming in our minds. It's just a question of time to be able to build out those models and tune those models so that they're really relevant. You do, you do on that, which is not trivial either. So there's a whole nother capability from a content of really being able to select what are the different sources and to be able to curate those sources and bring them all in so that you can drive that user experience on that. And we give the customer the ability to select those different sources if they so choose. Because you have different, and those sources can be done on different topics, if you will. Because what you might want in IoT could be different than you know, other topics on that. So we know that there's going to be some uni or some flexibility that we need to build in there for the customers, and that's really what we've done. So we really wanted, the way I kind of look at it is, think of it as a stereo. And you've got all these different dials, if you will, on that stereo. What we want to be able to do is to give the customer the ability to create their own music and tune those dials however they want for their employees or their partners or their customers. Anything else? You guys are quiet. The tw you mean like the the, the periscope? You mean? Yeah, you, you said there are a lot of. Oh well, speakers. the thing with Twitter. Oh, okay, so on the Twitter feed, you're talking about stuff that's all time-based. Mm -hmm. We're not at all about time. We're all about content, and the value of that content. So you could think of a piece of content that might be a year old, but it could be just a phenomenal learning asset, and if that's very relevant to that user. That's going to be that's going to show up in their their feed. So it's not Twitter is all just boom 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 time. You know, if you don't see it in the first whatever 30 seconds, it's gone or, or a minute, it's gone on that. We're we're all about the content and the experience about making sure that that content matches up to what the person is interested in either learning or sharing about. Did you have a separate question? You're probably pretty good at the math there. I, I can't run it quite that quickly. Is that reflective of corporate spending and learning? No. No, no it, it, it is, and it's a higher number because GE puts a, a huge precedent on the, the value of education and training. So I think that they're, they're a little bit more on the forefront of that, but we're still seeing a lot of money being spent you know, from corporations on training. What we're seeing, though, is, is that it moving really from the formal training more into the informal side because they're getting a higher ROI and a higher output from the employee as well as a greater level of satisfaction. So we're starting to see that change on that, but, but that's, that's a transformation that is in process and it's going to take time. It'll probably take 10, 15 years for that to, to, to really you know, come into effect. But you look at some of the leaders that are doing it today and they're the ones that are, that are the innovators and if you don't innovate, you're going to be out. So, and that's what's so impressive about GE because of the, the size and the scale that they're operating. I mean, it's, it's just staggering. I mean, HBR is going to have a field day when they, when they do this whole, this digital transformation and really be able to prove that it works. And I mean, there, there's some very, very bright people over there and they know exactly what they're doing. It, it's really fascinating to watch. So I know that I'm getting the one minute, so I don't want to keep you guys between now and lunch. So thank you very much for for attending. If you have any questions, feel free to uh, ask me afterwards. And um, I hope that you enjoy the rest of the, uh, the conference. Thank you.